Thank you for joining me for this episode. Today, we're joined by Dr. Debbie Jones, and we're going to be speaking about red light therapy and myopia being the standard of care on the Myopia Podcast. Welcome to the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Well, thank you for joining me for this episode. Uh, as said, we've got uh, Dr. Debbie Jones on the podcast today, and uh, I would uh, I'd love to hear a little bit about uh, red light and what your thoughts are, uh, Debbie. If we can uh, just dive right in and talk a little bit about that. If you're not aware of who Debbie is, she is at the uh, University of Waterloo and uh, is really making a dent in so many things, contact lenses, but uh, really is somebody I admire in the myopia space. So thank you for being here. And uh, yeah, Debbie, share a little bit with us about uh, your perspectives on red light. Well, I feel like it's probably a little bit like when atropine was first like broached people was like oh oh right well show me a bit more evidence and oh yeah I don't know you know I don't know if I want to do that myself um, yeah. and then I think you know when the evidence started to come and people started to see the results there was more of a you know an interest in adopting there were some early adopters some still People, I think, that are still a bit cynical, skeptical about atropine, a little bit worried. I mean, do we have long, long term data on atropine? You know, is this going to be another one of those that, you know, like some of the pharmaceuticals, not eye related, that people look back years later and go, "Ooh, ouchie. Yeah, shouldn't have done that. Or is it going to be great? Yeah. You know, yeah. I think um, the big thing for me for I know I'm slightly off topic about red light, but with atropine is. I think we have alternatives to go to when you've used up whatever your allocation of numbers of years of atropine might be, you know, so as an individual, if you decide I'm good with two years, I'm good with five years, I'm good with 10 years, whatever you personally are good with, you can then move to something else. Yeah. So, you know, I think we have great options and that's for me, a little bit of a sort of a safety net, a little bit of a comfort zone that it's not, you know, forever. And I wonder if the same with the red light, I mean, there's, there's stuff out there, there's evidence that's beginning to infiltrate the literature. But when you look at the conclusions, even the authors are saying, we need more information. We need more data. Yeah. We need to know more. It's promising. And that's the word that seems to be being used. The results are promising. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think I would say the same. It's promising. I mean, wow, wouldn't it be an easy fix? Holy moly, three minutes twice a day. You know, anybody can get their kid to sit for three minutes. Well, maybe most, not all kids anybody. for three minutes, but you know, it's it's better than many of the alternatives right. if it truly is. I mean, it could be a game changer. My worry about it is kind of in the wrong hands. Are we going to get you know the? It's kind of a little bit like the uh, you know the Ray Ban copies or the Maui Jim copies. You know, they look the same, but they don't do the same kind of thing. You know, are right. We gonna a little box with a red light in it and somebody says this is what you need are we going to get the fake you know like the fake gucci's that you can buy on the street are we going to get the fake red light therapies um i mean i don't think that is the same with any of the other options out there you don't get fake myopia controlled contact lenses or spectacles but i i do worry if there's a market there for the amazon you know cheaper version type of thing right we see that in in dry eye right with people doing low level light or you yeah, know yeah. ipls are a dime a dozen over in china and uh you know coming out of china they don't do a lot of ipl in china as far as i understand but they make a yeah. lot of them and they may not be as effective in this you know the red light but also there's studies on uh violet light and um then there's this concern for safety. Like, are you are, are you going to be damaging the retina? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I don't mind trying something if it's not going to hurt, 
right? You like I'm 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 all up for doing something if yeah. it ends up not being helpful. Yeah, I agree. And but I was just potential saying, cost, right? Yeah, what what could it cost? Is yeah. the question. I was going to say the exact same thing. If it does nothing of any good, then okay, you know, we've got children who are higher myopes than they could have been, but we've got that happening all around the world as it is. It's unfortunate, but it's a reality. Yeah. But if it does harm, then we really are in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. And we've got decades of atropine being used for different reasons. Yes. We've got yeah. decade of orthokeratology being used. Uh, we don't have decades of the spectacle lenses, but we're kind of like, well, but they function similar to something else. We just, the, the world of syntonics, you know, is using light. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think that this is one of those areas where um, all of us have, in, in, my, in my practice, my wife does syntonics, but this is an area where we kind of maybe need to go look at those those syntonics people and say hey we need help here we you, you guys have been looking at light for a long time maybe we need to you know gain some knowledge from them and like yes yeah some risks here and i'm not seeing animal models coming out either i mean i'm not seeing you know the traditional publication of the animal models the studies you know and then you move through to the human trials I'm not really seeing that natural progression with the light therapy we seem to have just gone straight in to grab our myopic patients and let's try something different yeah. um feels like the myopic patients have become the like the animal model they've become the the entry level because it's this desperation to and I think it's a desperation to skip some of the steps perhaps to a make a difference in the myopia space but also commercialize things you know i mean the reality is people are looking for that one thing that's going to change the world of myopia but it's also going to you know put them on the map so i do yeah. worry we're skipping over and i had a conversation just this week totally unrelated within the myopia space and somebody said well where are the animal studies for this and it wasn't that red light, it was something completely different. And it was like, well, you know, other animal studies on similar things have shown. So it feels like a natural progression that we didn't need to do the animal studies. So, yeah. you know, yeah. I, I get it. But this to me feels so different that perhaps we do need some really fundamental basic science to give us that confidence that we can move to that next level. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's not, you know, in, in the animal studies arena, you know, we did animal studies in orthokeratology, but we had been doing it in adults for years and years. And we we're like, hey, this is helping in myopia. Yeah. We need more evidence. We need more data. And then we went back to animal studies and it feels like this is kind of like, let's rush into it. Your, yeah, your, your exactly. point. What do you think, Debbie, needs to be done? And like, how do you see this? next couple of years for for this to be worked out how would you lay out research and studies that would then make you feel comfortable what needs to take place for you to feel comfortable you know it's the long-term randomized clinical trials it's the standard conventional way of looking at those products whatever they might be it's getting the volume of patients across different ethnic groups making sure that you're running a really tight clinical trial and looking really, really carefully at the retina, the visual function, not just the myopia. I mean, are we changing, you know, are we changing contrast? Are we affecting other sorts of visual function? Yeah. So a solid, solid clinical trial. And I think they're probably out there. I mean, you look at the authors that are starting to publish and they're, they're credible authors. I mean, they they're not just you know, not, and they're incredible journals. So I think, you know, there's, there's confidence there. There's just not enough yet. It's small studies, small numbers of children. And you look at what the authors are saying and they're saying it's promising, but, you know, another year or two um, we'll see. And I think, you know, the publications are saying there's been no adverse events, no, you know, adverse effects, but do you get adverse effects in a year? Does it take two years? Does it take three years? Um, 
yeah, we don't know. And maybe some animal studies. I mean, I, there may be some in the literature that I just haven't seen. I mean, I can't imagine somebody's not doing some solid animal work. Um, but seeing that and making sure that, you know, there are no, as you say, it's it's the side effects that we worry about. Yeah. Um, because yeah. if your retina is damaged, it's damaged. It's no going yeah. back. Well, I've I've been in contact with people in China who are doing this and are showing some case reports and showing effectiveness of it. And I'm just, hey, keep sending those to me. I want to keep looking at them. Uh, but then they're offering up devices for me to buy for my patients, right? So it's already in that arena of the commercialization. Yeah. And uh, and man, I want to slow down myopia, but I don't, I don't know, I don't know how risky we we should be. And um uh, you know, you're, you're, you're right on. This is still, this is still years away from being mainstream unless somebody surprises you and me. And we both know what's happening in the myopia world, but Hey, somebody comes out with a three-year study. That's uh that surprises all of us. That'd be great to read. I, you know, Arvo's going on right now and I haven't heard any reports of some big studies. So it'd be nice oh, to, no. nice to see um, that, um, you know, standardization of the device. I mean, you know, what level of light are we talking about? What wavelength are we talking about? What's the variability? You know, who is going to put that CE mark or whatever it is that you need to say, you know, this is what you need, not right. somewhere between this and this, you know, a range. But, right. you know, I think in the UK, there's a device that's available. And I was I was just actually trying to look that up. And I couldn't remember um, what it was called. I thought I remembered what it was called, but I couldn't find it. But I think in the UK, there is actually something that's commercially available from what looks like a credible company, not just an online thing. That's actually a device that you can purchase. So, yeah. you know, it, it's there um, and people are getting excited and I'm super excited. I mean, it takes me back to, gosh, my days as a student when we used to do um Oh, heavens, what was it called? We used to do amblyopia therapy with a little light box and the, we had the patients in and they would just draw letters and numbers and things. Um, I can't remember what the box was called. And we used to have patients sitting for hours at this thing and Monday night orthoptics clinic in they came and they all sat and they doodled all over their little plastic um, screen on top of the red light box. And it seemed to work. I got one guy from able to pass his bus driving vision standard when they took all the bus conductors off, when they went to single door buses. I mean, God, you can tell how old I am. We went from where you used to hop on at the back and grab hold of the pole and the conductor would give you a ticket to uh -huh. a driver at the front. And so all the conductors had to retrain as drivers. And this patient bought me the biggest bunch of flowers imaginable. I was a student, I was so impressed. Because I got him through, you know, doing this amblyopia therapy. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, we seem to be going full circle. Um, yeah. so I'm not dismissing it. I think it could be it right. could be awesome. Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, you could be doing in-office training, training, you know, in-office myopia therapy, a bit like vision training. You could have patients come in for it. You could do it at home. I mean, there's all sorts of opportunities here. But. Yeah, let's have this conversation in five years and see where we're at. I mean, maybe yeah. myopia world will be a very different place then. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You you bring up your experience with light being effective on the visual system. And uh, you know, to to credit my uh my team here in our office, we do vision therapy and we've been treating strabismus and head injury and amblyopia with uh light-based therapies that's been going on for years and years and years. I mean, we have patients with head injuries who are back to functioning, right? And it's because they stared at a box. We we understand that in, in the eye care world that yeah. it happens and affects people with seasonal affective disorder when they, you know, get light. In, but you know, I think we all kind of thought it was pseudoscience and really it's it's effective. So I think we have a lot to learn here. And And, and likewise, I'm excited for five years down the road where hopefully we've got some really good data. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it is a very exciting time. I mean, there is so much in the space and so many people are really starting to realize, I mean, this whole thing about it being standard of care, you know, the WCO has really put themselves out there and, you know, I'm going to do a shout out for Canada because we are still, I believe the only country that it is standard of care that the Canadian association has said, Yes, myopia control is standard of care. 
Um, but, you know, we're getting there in other, other jurisdictions. There's certainly endorsements from societies and organizations and regulatory bodies. Um, and I think practitioners are realizing that this isn't something I choose whether I want to or I don't want to do. This is something I have to do. You know, I have clinicians that say to me, oh, well, you know, I'm not so sure. And I'm like, really? You're really not so sure? Then you get further into the conversation. They're like, yeah, I know I should be doing something. And I think we're starting to see the tide shift. It's not just the early adopters and the go-getters. It's it's your, what I would call mainstream, regular practice, are starting to realize, hey, this is something I should do. And of course, depending upon where you are in the world, it can be super, super easy. If you have spectacles as an option, I mean, we are, again, hate to say it, but we're golden up here in the great north because we do have all the options. Um, we have spectacles, right. contact lenses, atropine. We've got the whole shopping cart full of stuff. So, so, so Debbie, let me let me push on that just a little bit. So you do have more options than we have here in the states, and um, and and we, I mean, people all over the world are listening to our podcast, but mostly in North America. Mm -hmm. So how does this really become standard of care, and how does that work into Joe Blow's everyday practice? Do you foresee that being something that people take on? like a, a specialty of specialty contact lenses, or is this something, where, and, and if they don't take on specialty lenses, then they refer that out, uh, or is this something like soft contact lenses, not, not meaning that they fit soft multifocals, but mm -hmm. that everybody does, like this is a, a standard thing that everybody is doing, or do you think this is really going to take a division as being like, I don't really do a lot of glaucoma. So I send that over to my friend over here. I don't do myopia management. So I send that over here, but I do diagnose it and I do send it out. Like, how do we, how do we get there? How does that go? And how, how is that happening in the great white North? <laughs> Perfectly, I'm sure. <laughs> well, oh, of course not. Um, I think there's, there's two, you've really hit the nail on the head. There's two options. You either do it and you do it well. I think you take it on and say, yeah, I'm doing this. You dabble, which is probably not the best, or you refer out. Yeah. Now, if you're a dabbler, you have to choose what you're going to dabble in. Um, and you're probably not dabbling in ortho K. So you're probably limited in your choices, but you still have choices. And I have, I have colleagues um, out in the community that don't do ortho K, but they do spectacles, atropine and soft lenses. So they're doing everything other than ortho K. They have patients that come in and say, I want ortho K. They've done their homework. They know what they want. They refer them out. So they are managing their myopic patients very, very well. I do have others that say, yeah, don't do it. I have practitioners who say, I don't do children. I don't see children in my office. I don't dispense in my office. You know, I, I focus on whatever, glaucoma, for example, yep. diabetes. Yep. And then they refer them out. So I think the key thing is, that you know that something has to be done. What we want to stop is the, I don't do myopia control, so I'm putting all of my myopes in single vision spectacle lenses. That's where we are, That that's the problem zone. It's that awareness and acknowledgement that just because you don't do it, doesn't mean your patient doesn't deserve it and need it. Yeah. So you well, can't it, it, that patient in their single vision spectacles just because you want to keep your patient. You've either got to get on board and start managing them properly, or you've got to say, I don't do this. My colleague does. Now, if you're in a, a multi doc practice, then right. that's awesome. You know, somebody else might do it. Yeah. yeah but if you're a, a sole practitioner, you do have to release that patient. You have to let them go. Yeah. Well, I think it kind of comes down to that if if we say it is standard of care, then we have the vast majority of people believing it exists, right? And and that if it exists, then it must be treated. And uh, I, I I would have a hard time believing, and I don't know that liability is is coming into the table yet, but it, at some point it will. But if you believe that myopia exists and you don't do it, 
then that is just a, a big shame. Uh, and then dabbling means that you are not a full believer because if you're, you're doing it on some patients, but not another, that's like, you know, if, if I have a patient whose pressures are 30 and they're not ready to go with treatment, okay. I'll just let them go. Right. Yeah. But then somebody else might really want to get that treated. Well, we yeah. wouldn't, we wouldn't approach it that way. Right. So either you're in or you're out. And if you're in, you have to treat it, right? We have to treat that patient with high pressure. If I don't treat it, then somebody else is, yeah. right? But I, you can't really dabble and be a believer, right? I, I think. Yeah, I think you can be in, but perhaps not fit ortho K. Okay. I think that's the one that sure. scares people. So you can be fully in and that one is, yeah, it's a little bit more specialist, you know, it's not mainstream contact lens fitting. It's a bit like fitting sclerals, you know, it's not for everybody. So I think you can be all in. Um, the other thing is we need the parents to be educated. We need to get public education because if the public drive it, if they come to you and they know that there's something that can be done, then you're going to look ridiculous if you say, yeah, I don't do that. Yeah. So we do need it. And I don't know how to crack that nut at all. I mean, public education is huge. Um, I think there's more awareness, but there's so much more awareness. Um, and I actually, you mentioned about um, kind of litigation. When I speak to the students in, in the course that I teach, I do say to them, you know, if you don't do this and a 16 or 17 year old minus seven myope comes to you and has had a retinal detachment, I wonder if they might turn around and say, this is your fault yeah. because, you know, you could have stopped me becoming a seven diopter myope. Now, there is no way of knowing. You have three doctor myopes who get detachments. I mean, there is no way of knowing, but you don't want that patient turning around saying, seriously, you know, this is your fault. Yeah. Um, well, I, 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 unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, I guess I don't really know which it is, but I think that there is an eye care provider that is a first year through those that are graduating today. There is one of those somewhere in North America in the 50, 60, 70,000 that we have in Canada and the US, somebody is going to get sued for myopia mismanagement. You know, I think within the group that we have, there will be as that evidence continues to come out. I'm not cer certainly not advocating for our profession to get uh, a lawsuit. Um, and I hope that that person is able to just push through the, uh, the education, but it's going to be because of a loss of vision. Right. Yeah. And I think we're getting that evidence, but uh, if that's a, that's a scary place for us to be. So uh, we, 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 we need to keep that education going yeah. both for parents as well as for our, our colleagues. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think it would be a hard one to prove one way or the other, but yeah. you know, you don't want the patient in the chair with the detachment looking no. at you saying, could I have done something? Could you have done something? Should yeah. I have done something different? Um, so yeah, yeah. And, and it's just the right thing to do. I mean, it's standard of care because it's the right thing to do. Yeah. And there's the evidence. I mean, the Canadian Association didn't just pick it out of thin air and say, sure, we're going to make this standard of care. You know, regulatory bodies don't stick their neck out easily. Um, no. They looked at the evidence. We did a lot of work together to come up with, you know what, you could really change the way we practice. And there was enough evidence because yeah. there is enough evidence. You know, we're a long way down this route now. This isn't early adopter stage, we are a long way down the myopia control um, pathway. And we know that it is the right thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. Debbie, how, uh, I like to ask this of people, how do you define myopia slash nearsightedness? What's, what's your definition of that? In terms of to parents or just how, uh, yeah, sure. Or, or even to another clinician. I mean, the the very high level definition would be vision clear up close and blurry in the distance without correction. Because 
the eye is longer than it should be and light focuses in front of the retina. So that would be kind of the next thing. If we're talking about then going into myopia control, we get that sense of, you know, the eye is longer. I'll often say to parents, you know, we're all dished out the same amount of retina. We're all in the same retina queue. And as the eye gets longer, the retina has to stretch over a yeah. you know bigger area. And, you know, we've all used those um, same analogies of saran wrap or a balloon. You know, I don't usually use balloon because that sounds like it's going to pop and a, you know, <laughs> pop. But yeah, I've done the same thing. You know, saran wrap stretching and then or, you know, any sort of plastic being stretched over something. So it depends on the parent as to where I go with the discussion. Um, yeah. Terms of- I, I, I love that. And and I, I, I love the what you, you mentioned is that we're all dished out the same amount of retina. Right. We, we all have the same amount. It's just how stretched it is. Yeah. And uh, I think my definition of myopia until the last couple of years has been blurry vision far away. Right. Yeah. But I, I love that you also have because of. Right. And so mine has now changed to myopia is a progressive disease that is the elongation of the eyeball. Right. With yeah. symptoms of blurry vision increasing prescriptions and higher risks of eye disease, right? So I'm working to change that to say Mm -hmm. that this is what it is. And that results in blurry vision and increasing prescriptions. Yeah. I don't use disease at the beginning of the conversation because parents get a little, you know, that there's already a, a sense. So you found a prescription, the child's not, you know, sometimes it's a shock when the child's not even seeing well, and they're like, oh my goodness, what's going on? So yeah. I tend to avoid my, my three go-tos actually yeah. for talking about myopia control and why it's important are um, better uncorrected vision. So, you know, as a minus four myope that I am, I don't go to the kitchen to make tea without putting my specs on. You know, your kid will be able right. to see when they're, you know, at the lake with their friends or so if they've got a low prescription, they'll be able to manage uncorrected. Yes. Um, the big one that parents resonates with parents for me is better options for laser vision correction later on. Yeah. That one makes them sit up in the chair. And yeah. then the last one I say is less risk of vision complications or, you know, eye complications later on that can lead to vision loss or vision reduction. It depends kind of on the parent as to how detailed. I don't tend to hit them with your child is going to have all these eye diseases because of course, we're talking about a lot later, you know, if they ask, well, is this like next year? I'm like, no, oh, when they're kind of 50, no. 60 and 70 and the parents are like, I don't know what's for dinner, let alone what my kid's doing tomorrow. I can't <laughs> imagine them being 70. So I try and really hone in on the kind of the short term yeah. reasons throwing in, you know, and I'll throw in cataract retinal detachment glaucoma because those are things that people have heard of and that tend to be quite scary you know it's amazing how scared patients are of cataracts when you're like oh my god if you've got (laughs) that's right they are god's sake have a cataract um so that's my kind of entry discussion and then of of course you get the smart parents that want to know so much more um yes really just telling them we need to keep this prescription as low as possible for as long as possible and we have straightforward methods to do this now again you know i hate to gloat but we have spectacles up here which is so easy to discuss because you say it's special type it's a special type of spectacle lens that has been shown to slow down progression end of story your kid needs a vision correction i'm going to put them in a better spectacle lens yes your gloating is going to be less profound when people are listening to this in a year and we have spectacles too. I, I I'm so proud of you having spectacles. I, Way to go, Debbie. You did no, it. I, I hope for you and every country in the world that spectacles are coming your way yes. sooner rather than later. Because honestly, Dave, it's been a game changer. Yeah. Because it yeah. makes the conversation so easy. You're not forcing drops on them. You know, I mean, you've done a cyclo on the kid and they've had a complete hissy fit. And now the parents yeah. are saying, you want me to put drops in every night or yeah. a 
six-year-old that you're saying contact lenses are really the way to go and they're going you want me to put contact lenses on my six-year-old so i think we're going to have a series of the myopia podcast in the month or two before we get spectacles so you can tell <laughs> us how to best present them how to best add them into our practice and then we'll rely on uh, our, our our Canadian brothers and sisters who are so much wiser than us to be able to instruct oh, us. No, we're, we're not wiser. We're just luckier. We <laughs> luckier? Have, yeah, earlier. We yeah. don't have those, you know, lovely three letters, the FDA, uh, to worry about in the same way as you do. So Yeah. So you're probably going to get red light right away and uh, bring it in. We want it, though. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll be looking for FDA approval for that before yeah, I jump on yeah. that one. Which, uh, well, awesome. I think this is a, a fantastic uh, place for us to wrap up. I mean, we kind of just dug into this red light topic and I love hearing about standard of care. And uh, I'm so excited for that to continue to be a conversation we bring up to our patients. I really appreciate you sharing your perspectives with me. You're welcome. And I think it's up to us to drive that standard of care. We, we in some ways set our own standards. So let's, let's set it as standard of care yeah. and, uh, and drive it. Yeah, that's awesome. And thank you for joining us for this episode. Make sure to like and subscribe. Stay tuned for future episodes for another awesome person like Dr. Debbie Jones. Thank you. One, two, three, four. Thank you for tuning in to the Myopia Podcast. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review and don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.